Forge at the Math Citadel, where we discuss our research. All topics we talk about have been published as original papers on the Math Citadel website. For this first episode of our dependency series, we're going to take a look at the dependency structure that started it all, first kind dependence. Let's revisit one of the uh, classical scenarios in introductory probability, coin flips. So let's say I have a coin, you can pick your favorite, right? And I flip it, and it comes up either heads or tails. Now if it's a fair coin, the probability of heads is a half, the probability of tails is a half. And if I flip the coin in succession, then we'll get a sequence of heads and tails. So maybe I flip the first one, and it comes up with a head, then, then tail, then maybe another tail, then maybe a head, etc. Okay, so what we have here in this sequence of flips is that there is a probability that we're going to come up with a head. And we're going to title that little p. And there's going to be a probability that it comes up tails. And that probability, since there's only two options, is going to be titled q, but q is just 1 minus p, right? Two events and the probabilities of both had to have to add up to 1. All right. Now, we can look at this in more probabilistic terms as a Bernoulli random variable. Now, a Bernoulli random variable, and that's written this, looks at a random variable whose sample space consists of 0 and 1, failure and success. Now, in our case, a lot of times people take the head to be the success, and zero to be the tails, that a failure. So then we can say, well, now we have, uh, instead of heads, tails, tails, and heads, we can say we had a sequence of a one, a zero, a zero, and a one, etc. Now what's the probability of various sequences? Let's just play with that real quick. If we have, let's not do a fair coin because it makes our lives a little bit more fun. Let's say the probability of the heads is one-fourth, and that means the probability of tails is three-fourths. So what is then the probability, what is the probability of the sequence one, zero, zero, or one head followed by two tails? Well, we're going to assume that these coin flips are independent, and we all kind of intuitively know what that means. If I flip a coin, whatever outcome happens, happens, and then I flip it again. Now the second coin doesn't care what happened to the first coin, right? Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter whether the first one came up tails or heads, the probability that the second one will come up heads is still the same. So with that, then we can look at that. The probability of the sequence 1, 0, 0 would be the probability that it comes up heads, 1 fourth, times the probability that it comes up tails next, 3 fourths, times the probability that it comes up tails again, 3 fourths. Okay? Now what about what if we kind of change the order around? Let's say a tails goes first, and then a head, and then a tail. All right, so that would be the sequence 0, 1, 0, that probability. So that's 3 fourths times 1 fourth times 3 fourths again. All right, so we notice that even though the, tail, the tails and the heads happened at different locations in the sequence, right? In the first example, the head came first, and the second example, the head came second. But the probabilities didn't matter, right? The, ult, the, the product of these probabilities is still the same. This is what happens when a sequence of Bernoulli random variables is independent. All right, we have a really nice way to kind of diagram all of these possible sequences out in the form of a tree. So let's take a look here. We're going to draw some nice, neat little dots to make this tree. All right, now at the very start, when we flip the first coin, or basically look at the first Bernoulli random variable, we can get a one or a zero, with a probability p for a one, and q, one minus p for zero. Then we flip the next coin. We can get a one or zero, but the one or zero occurs after, right, uh, the first one happens. So that's still p and q. Now let's look at the third one. So now the nodes split again. Now why do these nodes split? Well, if you see here, depending on what happened with this first one, we can still have two options, 0 or 1 for the second one, but we've already started traversing this tree, meaning the first object in our sequence is a 1. Then let's say the second one came out of 0. All right, now we move down to here. 
So now the product of these two probabilities, P and Q, gives us the probability of a head first and then a tail. So we just follow the tree down and multiply as we go and we'll get the probability of certain sequences. So then let's say the third one comes out a one. So then the probability of a one, a zero, and a one is P times Q times P again. Now notice that each time we split, it's still just a zero and a one, right? It's given that the previous one had a certain outcome, we still have the same possible outcomes for the next one, and that's why you see these nodes split like that. So now let's go again. Let's say a zero came out first, so then we can follow the tree down to here, and then maybe it's a one here, and then maybe a zero, right? So now we can basically just trace down the tree, and if you trace down the tree of all of these possible paths, let's say there's only three in the sequence, you will get every possible sequence of three Bernoulli random variables, of which there are eight, right? So zero, zero, and zero, 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 and one, etc. Now what happens? The probability, since these are independent, the probability that we only get one head somewhere in there is all going to be the same. So it doesn't matter if we got the head first, that's going to be p q squared, or second, q p q, yeah, but, you know, that's just p q squared again, or third, 0, 0, 1. Written literally, it's q squared p, but again, that's the same thing as p q squared. This is what happens when these are independent. What happens if I shake up your world a little bit? Right? What if that second coin cared about the outcome of the first one? In other words, the probability that the second coin would come up heads would actually depend on the probability that the first one came up heads. So we're going to introduce the notion of a dependency coefficient, and we title this guy delta. He is a value between 0 and 1, and he is going to help us determine just how much the probability is going to change for getting ahead in successive outcomes of coin flips, depending on what happened with the first one. Now, we have other types of dependency, but we're just going to discuss um, the notion of first kind right now. So, basically, what happens if we have a head, a tail, and a tail, right? But what happens if the probability that this second one came up tails changed depending on whether or not the first one came up heads or tails. This dependency coefficient right here is going to help us weight those probabilities accordingly. Let's actually go back and review the notion of independence and what it means. Okay, so the probability that the second coin comes out ahead, given that the first coin comes out ahead, is just p. The probability that the second coin comes out ahead, given that the first coin came out a tail, still p, right? They're independent. In other words, the outcome of the first Bernoulli random variable does not affect the probability of the second random variable being a success or failure. Same goes for the probability that the second coin comes out a tail. That's q no matter what. Alright, now, under first kind dependence, the outcome of the first Bernoulli random variable changes the probability of success or failure of all of the subsequent random variables depending on what happened. And we use the dependency coefficient that we talked about in this last slide to weight those different probabilities. So the probability that the second random variable is a 1, given that the first one is a 1, is now p plus. The probability that the second one comes out a 1, given that the first one came out a 0, we're going to weight that less, p minus, and we'll go through what exactly each of these are defined in a second, but let's just call them p plus and p minus, because p plus means we're going to increase the probability that the second Bernoulli random variable is a 1 if the first one came out a 1, and we're going to decrease the probability that the second random variable comes out of 1 if the first one comes out of 0. We'll actually do the same for the other one, right? The other outcome being a 0. If 
the first one comes out a 1, if we increase the probability of the second one being a 1, we have to decrease by the same amount the probability that the second one comes out a 0, right? Because still, the probability that the second one comes out a 1 or a 0, given the first one, those still have to add up to 1. Alright, the probability that the second one comes out of zero, given that the first one came out of a zero, that's going to be Q plus, right? So what we see here is that we weight in favor of the outcome of the first random variable. So a couple of these other notes, right? P plus Q always has to add to one. And what we also need to recognize too is that this P plus plus Q minus. So P plus and Q minus Given that the first one comes out of one, right, now we're down the first node to the first node of one of the trees. We can either have a one or a zero. That means it can either be a P plus or a Q minus. Those still have to add to one. If we move down the other side of the tree where the first one is a zero, then we still have to we'll come out with either a one or a zero. But if this guy is P minus, then we have to make sure that the corresponding probability of the other event, Q plus, also adds to one. So P plus, in terms of the dependency coefficient, these are defined in the following ways. This is P plus delta times Q. Now remember that dependency coefficient was between zero and one. So it tells us how much we're going to add to our original P to weight in favor of it coming out ahead if the first one came out ahead. Now that Q minus, since that's the other option, right? If we had a one, the second one can either be a 1 or a 0. Well, if we added a delta Q to increase the probability of a 1, given that the first or newly random variable was a 1, we need to subtract that same amount from Q to make sure we still balance our probabilities. Now, the same thing goes for Q plus, right? If the first one comes out as 0, we're going to wait in favor of a failure in the second one. So Q plus delta P. We're going to add delta times P to Q if the first one comes out as zero to increase the probability that the second one comes out as zero. Well, if we do that, we have to subtract that same delta P from P minus to make sure that those probabilities still add up to one. All right, so that's a lot to take in. Let's put that in tree form so we can explore this a little bit further. All right, so let's take all of this information and put it into a tree. So remember that tree we had before. Now, the first one comes out. He can either be a 1 or a 0. And the probability of him being a 1 is still P. And the probability of him being a 0 is still Q, just like we had before. Now, what happens when we move to the second random variable? Right? Either, if we come out of P, we can still come out with either a 1 or a 0. Right? The, out, the possible outcomes don't change when the first one has already happened. It's just the probabilities of those things occurring. So, now let's watch and see what happens with epsilon 2. Now, here's what we notice. If we come out with a P, right? If we come out with a 1, then like I said before, we're going to wait in favor of coming out of 1, right? Here's the P plus. And that means we have to wait away from a 0, Q minus. If epsilon 1 came out of 0, we went down this side of the tree, which means we're going to wait in favor of what happened to epsilon 1, a 0. That's Q plus over here now. And P minus over here, because we're going to wait away from the outcome 0. So. You notice now, where we used to have just P and Q all the way across because it didn't matter what the first one did, now it does matter, and our probabilities have changed accordingly. So let's see what happens when we go to the third random variable. So same options. All right, so let's discuss this one really quick. Now this one, for epsilon 3, this one makes sense, P plus, right? Well, is it because epsilon 2 was a 1 or because epsilon 1 was a 1? So first kind dependence means that each subsequent random variable cares about what happened to the first one. In other words, 2 cares what happened to 1. 3 cares what happened to 1 
but not what happened to two. So let's take an illustration of that. So you notice over here, right here, where epsilon three is a one, but epsilon two is a zero. So what the sequence one, zero, one. Why isn't this one P minus? Well, because the first one was a one, right? We don't care what happened to that second random variable. We only care what happened to the first one when we decide how to weight epsilon three and epsilon four, etc. So that's why you have, essentially you have a P plus here and a P plus here, even though you had a zero for epsilon two right here. This is the first kind dependency structure. There are others, there are other varieties, but this particular structure, everything looks back to the first random variable. So then if we go over here, that means that if we basically go down the left side of the tree, all the subsequent random variables have a probability of success of P minus now, no matter what, right? So it's P minus for epsilon two to come out of one, it's P minus for epsilon three to come out of one, whether or not epsilon two was a one. So let's just do a quick example here. Remember that under independence, the probability of a one, a zero, and a zero was just P Q squared, right? because it didn't matter. Now, the probability of one, zero, zero under first kind dependence, so this was independent, and the, under first kind dependence, the probability of a one, a zero, and a zero, well, it's still P because the first one is P. We still trace down the tree just like we did before. And a zero and a zero, well, that's this. Here's a one, a zero, and a zero. That's the nice thing about these tree structures is we can always find these probabilities. It's actually Q minus squared. So in other words, the probability of that sequence one, zero, zero under first kind dependence is actually smaller than, the than it used to be under independence. Let's play with a few other examples now. Let's go to the extremes, right? If that dependency coefficient delta can be between zero and one, then what happens if delta is one? This is going to give us total dependence. So what do we have now? If we actually go back to the definitions of P pluses and Q minuses, we can see here that P plus is P plus delta Q. Well, if delta is one, that's just P plus Q, and we already know that's one. That means Q plus, same thing, right, is also one. That means P minus is zero and Q minus is zero. So let's fill in those trees with the probabilities now. So what do we have? Let's look at different sequences. So if I come up with a head, well, what happens? It means that now the probability that I get a tail is zero. That means this whole part of the tree right here from this split on down is now lost to us forever. If delta is one, everything is totally dependent on that outcome. I know that the entire sequence from now on will be all ones. What about if it comes out a tail? Well, same thing, right? Based on our definitions, that means that everything that follows it is going to be a tail. It means I will never get another head if that first one comes out ahead. In fact, the only thing that's random anymore under total dependence is that first one. Then everything else is deterministic. Now let's go back to the other extreme, totally independent. Now if delta equals zero, then what happens? Oh look, P plus and Q minus go back to their original P and Q. And what do we notice? The tree looks just like it used to. So at the other end of the extreme, we have complete independence, meaning we're back to our familiar successive coin flips where the outcome of the successive ones don't care what happened before it. Well, if delta can be between zero and one, right, where zero is totally independent and our nice, safe, familiar notion of coin flips, and delta equals one is totally dependent, meaning that the only thing that's actually random anymore is the first one, then that means we can have everything in between now where we couldn't before. So let's take a look at what happens when delta is something in between zero and one. Let's suppose that we're just gonna take a fair coin, right? The probability of heads is a half, probability of tails is a half, and let's use a dependency coefficient now of a half. 
So again, we've given our, our nice uh, first kind dependence tree here with its generic P pluses and Q minuses. So let's put some numbers to this now. All right, so what is P plus? P plus and Q minus, well, it's defined as P plus delta Q or Q plus delta P. And in both of those cases, that's gonna be 3 fourths. Now, P minus and Q minus, that's gonna be 1 fourth. So now we can replace our tree with those new probabilities. So 3 fourths for all the P pluses and Q pluses, and 1 fourth for all the P minuses and Q minuses. And we have this nice half up there for that first one. So keep in mind, why I put these in black? Remember that the first one, those original probabilities don't change, and these guys had changing probabilities that depend on the outcome of the first one. So now we can still just trace the tree to find any of the probabilities that we now want to. Now the probability that we get a one, a zero, and a zero would be a half times a fourth times a fourth. What about the probability that we get a zero, a zero, and a one, right? If the one comes third. So a half, a fourth, a fourth for one, zero, zero. Zero, one, zero, one, a half times three fourths times one fourth. Uh-oh, now the order in which that one comes matters for the probabilistic perspective where it didn't before. All right, now this doesn't just work on Bernoulli random variables with two categories. Maybe we have three categories. So how do we, how do we account for that now? So the probability that the first random variable is the first category is P1, the second one P2, and the third one P3. Now we can actually change these up and extend the notion of P plus and Q plus and P minus and Q minus to P1 plus, P2 plus, P3 plus, etc. These are called categorical random variables, right? So instead of having only two options, now we have three options, four options, five options. We can still extend the notion of first kind dependence to categorical random variables as well. We just have to redefine what it means for the different pluses and minuses here. So this is the outcome of the first categorical random variable, right? Either it can choose category one with probability P1, category two with probability P2, or category three with probability P3. Now we need to define our P pluses and P minuses to weight in favor of the outcome of the first one. So P1 plus is just gonna be P1 plus delta times, well, what was it before? It was one minus P, or basically Q, the probability of the other stuff. So P1 plus is P1 plus delta times the other stuff. P2 plus, P2 plus delta times the other stuff. P3 plus, P3 plus delta times other stuff. P1 minus, okay, so now we have to basically subtract a P1, a P2, and a P3 from each of the original P1, P2, and P3 to get P minuses. And in this way, when we group them for the tree, which we'll show next, we have to make sure that P1 plus, plus P2 minus, plus P3 minus still add up to one, which is how we end up with the weights that we do. So now we're gonna look at this tree again. This time we have three nodes coming off because there are three possibilities for the now categorical random variable epsilon one. Now, just as we did before, with each split of the tree, right, we now have divided this tree into thirds, we weight in favor of the outcome of the first random variable. That means that the probability that epsilon one selects category one is P1. The probability that epsilon two, epsilon three, epsilon four, and so forth select one is always going to be P plus, regardless of the outcome of the ones between it and epsilon one. So here's a P1 plus, right? The third one, it's P, the probability of it coming out of one is P1 plus, regardless of whether or not the second one was a one, a two, or a three. In other words, we weight in favor of the first one. This is still first kind dependence. We just have more options this time. Now, if we move down the second part, right? That means that we're gonna weight in favor of all the subsequent ones coming out a two. That means P2 plus, for epsilon two coming out of two, or epsilon three coming out of two. And that means we have to decrease the probabilities of one and three so that all three of these probabilities still add up to one. 
So you have a basically P1 plus plus P2 minus plus P3 minus adds up to 1, just like this adds up to 1, and this adds up to 1 as well. This is the general form of first kind dependence. So we can do this for any number of categories we want. The trees just get more ugly to draw, that's all. So we can do it with four categories, five categories, hundreds of categories, and in general, the weights work exactly the same. You're always weighting the outcome of the subsequent ones in favor of what happened to the first one. Okay, so we have a really nice way that we can actually view this. And we can draw this out as a graph, a really nice directed graph. So what you see here is, here's the first one. And this dependency graph we can draw and it shows exactly what every single random variable in the sequence depends on. Well, two depends directly on one. In first kind dependence, three also depends directly on one. So does four, five, six, all the way until you're at the nth one in your sequence. They all directly depend on one. And by the look of this graph, we can see what we could, maybe was a little bit subtle to see in the tree, is that three ignores two, five ignores three, six ignores two, everyone ignores everyone else but one. So we can actually generate this graph with something called a dependency generating function. And it tells us exactly what, given a particular n, some, some point in the sequence, what does that variable in the sequence depend on? Well, if we're at the fifth one, we depend on one. If we're at the eighth one, we depend on one. If we're at the twentieth one, we still just depend directly on one. So the dependency generating function that takes in the index of a random variable in the sequence and outputs the random variable that it directly depends on is just one, right? Everything depends directly on one and doesn't care about anything else. That's called a dependency generating function. And this guy right here is the dependency graph showing us how these random variables depend on each other. So why do we care? One, it's kind of interesting, right? Now we have the notion of actually dependent random variables, whereas before all we could say was that they, well, weren't independent. What kind of comes out of this that's really interesting that was actually proved by Korsanowski in 2013 for Bernoulli random variables that we played with earlier and by the Math Citadel in 2016 for categorical random variables, right, any number of categories thereafter, is that now I can still create a sequence of identically distributed variables that are still dependent. So when we had independent random variables, right, back when we were just flipping coins, the probability that any of them, so say any i came out ahead was just p. So for all the i's in the sequence, that mean, that was under in full independence. That means that all of these Bernoulli random variables in the sequence were something called identically distributed. Their probability of success was the same no matter what number they were in the sequence. One of the interesting results that came out of both, both Korsanowski's paper and our paper for both Bernoulli and categorical random variables is that this result the probability that epsilon i is equal to, now we're just going to say category j, right? This is a category, not a number. Let's make that really clear. Is still its original probability, even though it depends on other ones in the sequence, right? When you trace down the tree, you see that its conditional probability, the probability of it given something before it changed its overall probability of occurring doesn't. In other words, under first kind dependence, we still have a sequence of identically distributed variables. They're just dependent now, not independent. The only thing that we've lost is the notion of independence. Now, what does that mean for us other than some mathematical curiosities? Well, because many distributions are functions of sequences of both categorical and Bernoulli random variables, it means now 
we can have new probability distributions. Whereas before, a distribution like the binomial distribution, which counted the number of successes in a sequence of n, that one said that you have to have independent and identically distributed Bernoulli random variables. Otherwise, if you've got dependent ones, no go, no binomial distribution for you. That's not true anymore. We have that now. Now we have a generalized binomial distribution that can handle the notion of a sequence of Bernoulli random variables that depend on each other in the first kind manner. We've extended this to categorical as well. Now, the multinomial distribution, which is essentially the binomial distribution, but for categorical random variables, so that one is, in a multinomial distribution, you want to say, well, out of 30 different trials, or 30, a sequence of 30 categorical random variables, how many of them came out category A? How many of them selected category B? And how many of them selected category C? That's a multinomial distribution. And again, like the old version of the binomial distribution, you had to have a sequence of independent and identically distributed categorical random variables to be able to make that distribution. Now, with first kind dependence, we don't need that anymore. We can generalize the multinomial distribution as well to account for the fact that sometimes we don't have a sequence of independent and identically distributed random variables. We actually still know that even though the sequence is dependent, it's still identically distributed, which means we can still make distributions that are functions of this sequence, but are dependent now. Hey, thanks for sticking with us. I know this video got a little heavy. All new ideas do take time to really digest. So feel free to go back and rewatch any of it you like. You can also reach out to us anytime with questions. Until Korzanowski's original 2013 paper, no one had tried to formally define dependence in this way. We only knew dependence as not independent. And defining anything as the negation of something else has robbed us of a lot of potential to model real life scenarios much better, honestly you tell me what data isn't dependent in some way. The Mass Citadel is continuing to develop this new notion with other types of dependency structures which we have published on our website. The next video in the dependency series will discuss another type of dependency, sequential dependency. Thanks again for stepping into the heat of the forge with us as we create new mathematics. If you want to contact us, you can always go to our website at www.themathcitadel.com. There's a contact page on there. You can contact me on Twitter, at Mathpocalypse, or you can contact our delightful videographer, Jason Hathcock, at Jasonographer, or the official Math Citadel Twitter handle, at Math Citadel. Please note that we are interested in research partnerships. Companies looking to sponsor research will retain 100% patent rights for any applications that result from our new research. We also have a Patreon if you enjoy these videos, posts, podcasts, and Jason's wonderful photography. Then please visit the Math Citadel's Patreon page and consider leaving a donation to help keep this operation going. Thank you so much. Until next time. Now? What about now? Yes, now. Now? You're rolling now? Okay. Seriously, Berlioz? Why are you insisting on ruining my takes? Look at me. Stop ruining my takes. I can't. I can't. My bad. I got excited. Ahem. Excuse me. The Twitter handle for the lovely Jasonographer who is currently videoing this is at Jasonographer. Wait. Sounds like I have some blooper editing to do. Ah, oh, my life is a series of bloopers. Why, Jason? <laughs>